Thanks for tuning in to the Way of the Fathers podcast. Before we begin, I'd like to ask you a favor. We want to continue these podcasts and keep spreading the message of the fathers, and that requires funding. This year, a generous donor has extended a significant challenge grant. If we make our goal, then anything you give us will be matched. It will be doubled. So if we raise $50,000, we'll have 100000 to carry us through the rest of the year. Our drive will be short, running from May 1st through May 24th, 2023. Anything you send during these weeks will bless us twice and will ensure that we keep doing what we do. So please go now to catholicculture.org slash donate slash audio. Anything you give will be a great help. We've entrusted this drive to Mary Help of Christians, and we know she'll come through. Gaudeamus omnes in domino Diem festum celebrantes Sub honore sanctorum omni Welcome to The Way of the Fathers, a podcast sponsored by CatholicCulture.org. I'm your host, Mike Aquilina. In our current series, we're visiting great cities of the ancient world, and we're studying their path to conversion, how they were transformed from persecutors to believers through the ministry of the Church Fathers. In our last episode, we considered the theme in general. This time, we're going to begin our voyage at the beginning, in Jerusalem. All over the world, people are proud of the cities they live in. But no city was ever loved the way Jerusalem was loved. It's the holy city for Christians and one of the holiest places in the world for Muslims. But above all, it's still the center of the world for faithful Jews. Jerusalem, the city of David, is so much identified with the people of Israel that we forget that it wasn't originally an Israelite city at all. Like many cities in Israel, it was a Canaanite city at first. But unlike most of the other cities, it held out against the advancing Israelites. When Joshua led the Israelites into the Promised Land, they were very successful against most of their Canaanite enemies. But a few held out. The book of Judges tells us that the Jebusites were one of those holdouts. They were still there when the book was written because this is what it says. But the people of Benjamin did not drive out the Jebusites who dwelt in Jerusalem, so the Jebusites have dwelt with the people of Benjamin in Jerusalem to this day. That's Judges chapter 1 verse 21. When David became king, his capital was Hebron. The Jebusites taunted David, you will not come in here, but the blind and the lame will ward you off. 2 Samuel 5, 6. And it's true that the original part of Jerusalem sits on a site that's hard to reach. Precipitous slopes make it one of the most defensible of ancient cities. But they also give the city a big problem to solve. Water. There wasn't a good natural source of water inside the city. And some arrangement had to be made for bringing in water from outside, even when the city was under siege. That gave David his opening. David's men sneaked into the city through the Jebusites' water shaft. So, about a thousand years before Christ, David finally captured the Canaanite holdout city of Jerusalem and made it an Israelite city at last. Once David had taken Jerusalem, he made it his capital and brought the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem. Now it was the religious center of Israel. It became the place which the Lord your God will choose to make his name dwell there, as the book of Deuteronomy had foretold. Chapter 12, verse 11. From then on, sacrifices to God could be offered only at Jerusalem. King David built himself a fine palace with cedars of Lebanon imported from Tyre, but it was left to his son Solomon to build the temple, a permanent place of worship for the God of Israel. To later writers, this was one of the central events of history. 
But when Solomon died, his clumsy son Rehoboam provoked a rebellion in which most of Israel went its own way, leaving Rehoboam with Jerusalem and the stubby little kingdom of Judah. Jeroboam, the rebel king, was afraid the people would turn back to Rehoboam if they kept going to Jerusalem to worship. So he set up golden calves in his own territory and told the people, You have gone up to Jerusalem long enough. Behold your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. 1 Kings 12.28 Thus idolatry came roaring back for most of Israel, and most of the history of the northern kingdom, as written by the partisans of the God of Israel, is a history of the small minority of God's prophets warning the majority, who worshipped Baal and other popular deities, that they were headed for a bad time. Their predictions came true. The northern kingdom was wiped out by Assyria, and all the important people were taken away. That was the end of the northern kingdom, the lost ten tribes. What was left was Judah, which escaped Assyrian conquest by the skin of its teeth. Judah also fell into idolatry much of the time, but every once in a while a reforming king would come to the throne and take the prophet's warning seriously. Hezekiah was one of them. Jerusalem grew enormously during the time of Hezekiah, but the growth was not a sign of prosperity. The city ballooned with refugees as the Assyrians took more and more territory. Hezekiah responded by improving the water supply with a new tunnel and reservoir. He made the pool and the conduit and brought water into the city, says Second Kings 20.20. Addressing the same problem the ancient Jebusites had already faced with their water shaft, but on a larger scale. The Assyrian Empire was eventually conquered, and the Babylonian Empire was the power to worry about. In the reign of Jehoiakim, the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar conquered Jerusalem, took the king and the leading citizens off to Babylon, and made Jehoiakim's uncle Zedekiah his puppet king in Jerusalem. But even then, Jerusalem kept rebelling. Finally, the Babylonians had had enough. On the ninth of Ab, in the year 587 BC, Nebuchadnezzar's army burned the city, including the temple, the palaces, and every great man's house. 2 Kings 25.9 Half a century later, the Persians conquered Babylon, and a new emperor was in charge. This emperor, Cyrus, was different from the other conquerors. The year after he conquered Babylon, Cyrus decreed that any Judean who wanted to go back could return to Jerusalem. He even put up government money for restoring the city and the temple. This was typical Persian government policy, but it was a miracle to the exiled Jews. A few of them did move back into Jerusalem. The city was rebuilt on a smaller scale, and the foundation of a new temple was laid. It was a joyous occasion, with trumpets and cheers. But there were people there who remembered the Temple of Solomon. And this one was much smaller. The book of Ezra tells us that many of the priests and Levites and heads of fathers' houses, old men who had seen the first house, wept with a loud voice when they saw the foundation of this house being laid. Ezra 3.11. Jerusalem didn't really begin to prosper again until after the revolt of the Maccabees, when the new Jewish kingdom was established in 164 BC, Jerusalem expanded again, beginning to look once more like a real capital city. And then came Herod, King Herod the Great. This was the same Herod who tried to kill the infant Messiah by murdering all the children in Bethlehem. He was a client of the Romans, and he ruled only as long as they allowed him to. Herod loved big buildings and magnificent constructions of all sorts. He replaced the smaller second temple with a huge new temple that was one of the wonders of the age. He made Jerusalem into the great city that was the setting for the climax of the drama of salvation. So what was it like to come into the city when Jesus was alive? Let's imagine ourselves part of a big crowd coming toward Jerusalem for one of the festivals. In fact, 
Let's imagine ourselves coming in with the crowd that travels with Jesus as he enters the city for the last time. Before we even see the city, we can smell it. Many cities have been known for their industrial smells, but this one is different. Jerusalem smells delicious. Its biggest industry is sacrifice, so the smell of barbecue is always in the air. And then there it is, up on top of a hill, looking almost halfway to heaven. The temple with its gleaming stones dominates the view. But the magnificent walls and palaces are almost as impressive. It's an ancient city with ancient memories, but it looks amazingly new and up-to-date. That's Herod's work. The big city bustle is marvelous to us country folk, too. Everywhere, people are going places and doing things, and when we get to the temple, which we do, of course, because the reason anyone comes to Jerusalem is to visit the temple, we find the courtyards mobbed with buyers and sellers. When we get closer, we notice the price tags. Then we discover another amazing thing about Jerusalem. It's amazingly expensive. A pigeon is supposed to be the sacrifice that the poor can afford. Leviticus commands the sinner to offer a lamb, but then goes on to say, But if he cannot afford a lamb, then he shall bring as his guilt offering to the Lord for the sin he has committed two turtle doves or two young pigeons. Leviticus 5 7. But here in Jerusalem, a pigeon may cost a hundred times what it costs in the country. If you want your pigeon certified blemish free and sacrifice ready, it's going to cost you. Now we understand it a little better when we see Jesus really angry for the one time in his life. Here's how Mark tells the story. And he entered the temple and began to drive out those who sold and those who bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. And he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. And he taught and said to them, Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations? But you have made it a den of robbers. Mark eleven fifteen to 17 The merchants could charge these high prices because people were coming from all over the world to make their sacrifices. Many of them were on once-in-a-lifetime trips, and you can always squeeze money out of a tourist, especially when the tourist is overwhelmed by the sights. All the out-of-town visitors probably have the same reaction Jesus' disciples had. Look, teacher, what wonderful stones and what wonderful buildings! But Jesus' reaction must have surprised everyone who heard it. Do you see these great buildings? There will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. Mark 13, 1-2. He was right about that. In the year 68, Jesius Florus was appointed governor of Judea. He hated Jews, and he hated Judea, but he was a friend of Nero, and that got him the job. It seems as though he deliberately tried to see how much he could make his subjects hate him taking huge bribes for hearing complaints and then jailing the complainants, stealing funds from the temple, crucifying city leaders who were Roman citizens and couldn't legally be crucified. If making all Judea hate him was the plan, it worked. Open rebellion broke out. Nero sent his best general to put down the rebellion, Vespasian, who quickly pacified the rest of Judea. Jerusalem held out. During this time, according to Christian historians, the small Christian community was warned by a prophecy to leave Jerusalem. They went to a little town called Pella and waited for the fulfillment of Jesus' prophecy that not one stone would be left upon another. They didn't have long to wait. The rebels were surprisingly successful at first, but they had no good leaders and no strategy. Meanwhile, Vespasian was called off to be emperor. It was the year of the four emperors. Nero had been killed shortly after the Jewish war broke out, and one after another useless emperors succeeded him until the soldiers chose Vespasian, who stuck. He left his capable son Titus in charge of the siege of Jerusalem. In spite of the fanatical defense, 
Titus did his best to be lenient on the innocent civilians. More than once, he offered to stop the battle in the city and go outside to fight. He even offered to stop the battle long enough to let the Jewish priests make their sacrifices. But the rebel leaders were determined to fight to the end. Possibly, their early successes had convinced them they could win. Possibly, they wanted to die now rather than later. At any rate, Titus was humane and even kind by Roman standards. But he wasn't going to be a loser. Even as the fighting raged, Titus tried to preserve the temple. He said it was an ornament to the whole empire. We can stop and think for a moment what a remarkable building Herod's temple must have been if the Roman commander did his best to save it even when his enemies were using it as a fortress. But even Titus couldn't save it. On the ninth of Ab, the very day Nebuchadnezzar had burned Solomon's temple, the last battle was fought, and the temple burned. When Titus heard that it was on fire, he ran to the fire and tried to put it out. He ordered his soldiers to extinguish the flames, but they were winning now, and they were beyond control. The temple was destroyed, and what was left of Jerusalem was destroyed with it. Christians saw the destruction of the temple as the fulfillment of Jesus' prophecies. Not one stone was left upon another. Well, almost. One retaining wall, the western wall, is still standing today. For traditional Jews, it is the holiest place in the world. It's often called the Wailing Wall, because there is where faithful Jews mourn the loss of the temple and the holy city of Jerusalem. In 130, the Roman Emperor Hadrian decided to rebuild Jerusalem as a new pagan Roman city, Aelia Capitolina. Hadrian came from the Aelius family, and he dedicated his new city to three pagan gods of the capital of Rome, Jupiter, Juno, and Minerva. This caused another bloody revolt. Even in ruins, Jerusalem meant more to Jews than Hadrian could imagine. The revolt failed again, and Hadrian went ahead with his plans, trying to obliterate the memory of Jerusalem as a focus of Jewish national hopes. According to Christian historians, he did his best to obliterate the sites Christians revered too. He piled dirt over the Holy Sepulchre, for example, and built a pagan temple there. But Christians made the pilgrimage to Jerusalem anyway. One of the most fascinating fathers— Melito of Sardis made the journey in the 2nd century. Gregory of Nyssa went in the 4th, as did Egeria, Jerome, Paula, Eustochium, and countless others. From our point of view, it seems as if Hadrian's colony was an utter failure. No one but historians even remembers that there was an Aelia Capitolina. Jerusalem is the name of the place now. As it was before Hadrian tried and failed to obliterate its memory. Hadrian failed, but the city we see today is very much Hadrian's city. Its street plan comes from Hadrian, who had it laid out in the usual form of a Roman colony, with main streets running east-west and north-south intersecting at the center. The Temple Mount remains from Solomon's time, and some of Herod's great stones are still there, but the shape of the streets is Hadrian's. It was Constantine, the first Christian emperor, who began the resurrection of Jerusalem as Jerusalem. His mother, Helena, started a fad for religious pilgrimages to the holy places associated with Christ, and she financed an expedition that dug past Hadrian's pagan temple to get to the Holy Sepulcher. After that, the city was the most important center of pilgrimage for Christians, and it did produce a bishop renowned among the greatest mystagogues of the ancient church, the illustrious Cyril, who ruled the church there from 350 to 386. But Jerusalem was never the most important center of Christian thought. Rome, Alexandria, and Antioch had developed into the centers of church authority and teaching. The rest of the history of Jerusalem is full of drastic changes, yet somehow the city remains what it is, Today, it's still a flashpoint, a place claimed by two different states and three different religions. 
Yet it's also a place where life moves so slowly that some of the merchandise still comes into the center of the city on donkeys. Much of that merchandise is trinkets and doodads to be sold to Christian tourists from all over the world. Just as in Constantine's time, tourism is big business in Jerusalem. Christian pilgrims come from all over the world to see where Jesus taught, where he suffered, and where he died. They aren't seeing the same city. Jerusalem has been destroyed and rebuilt several times since Jesus knew it. But in another sense, Jerusalem is always the same. It's the pattern for the Jerusalem all of us will know sooner or later. The whole Bible ends with the vision of Jerusalem, not the old city, burned and rebuilt so many times, but a new and wonderful place. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling of God is with men. He will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be with them. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. Revelation 21, 2-4 De quorum solemnitate gauden tangeli et collaudant Way of the Fathers is a production of CatholicCulture.org. Check out our other podcasts, including Catholic Culture Audiobooks, bringing to life classic Catholic writings. Criteria, the Catholic Film Podcast, featuring deep analysis of great films from a Catholic perspective. And the Catholic Culture Podcast, an interview show exploring Catholic arts, culture, and issues. You'll find all of this, as well as Catholic news, commentary, liturgical year resources, and much more at CatholicCulture.org.